Welcome to Advanced Computer Architecture. So my name is Sumner. Um, if you can't tell, I'm not Bo Wu, um, but if you just want an Asian dude to talk to for a couple hours a week, then well, you'll get that. All right, a little bit um, about these slides. Um, definitely not mine. Um, I've, I've taken Dr. Ru's slides. I've, I have done some touching up. They kind of sucked. Um, so I've, I've touched most, I'm gonna transcribe most of them to LaTeX and update a few other things as well. Make it a little bit better for remote learning. So I don't have to use a whiteboard, for example, um, stuff like that. And then Dr. Wu also um, borrowed from some other instructors as well. Here are some of them. These are um, top researchers in computer architecture um, at CMU, Utah, UCSD, and Princeton. So a lot of the material are, are from, in this course are from these professors. So, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is Sumner. You should call me that. Um, Jonathan is my legal first name, but I don't go by it. Um, it's hit or miss on whether or not I'll respond. I, I probably will, but who knows. Um, I don't have a PhD. Don't address me as doctor. Um, just professor isn't necessary. None of that formality is necessary. First name basis is totally fine. Um, I am a Minds alum, both bachelor's and master's from here in computer science. And I'm currently a software engineer at the trade desk. So that's me. Um, what we're gonna do today is we're just gonna talk about what is architecture, um, why it is at all important. Um, then we're gonna talk about the class. We're gonna talk about um, you know, what you should expect from it. Uh, and then we'll talk about kind of the current state of computer architecture, if we have time, um, and class logistics. And then this is probably what's gonna be cut out is a bit of brief history of computing, but you can look at the slides if you would like. Okay. What is architecture? So what do you think, hey Leo, how are you? Um, what do you think when you hear the word architecture? Maybe you think of Notre Dame, right? Well, it doesn't look like this anymore. Part of it's missing. Um, this isn't the architecture we're talking about, but I think it does have a lot of parallels to computer architecture in the sense that, you know, if you look at this structure, right? Um, they wanted it to be very tall, right? So that's a decision that they, that they made about a priority that they had for this structure but it came with some trade-offs, right? They had to have all these flying buttresses. They had to have a lot of stone and not very many windows, so it's really dark inside. There are definitely trade-offs to their, to their goal. And yeah, it's magnificent. If you look at the front of this thing, which I don't have a picture of, you know, it's, it's iconic. Um, but yeah, so, so in, in the sense that we're gonna be looking at a lot of uh, computer architecture things, in terms of trade-offs as well. Um, we'll see stuff like, yeah, you can increase your um, cache size, for example, but guess what? That's gonna make it slower because it's now a big cache is gonna take up a lot of space on, on a chip, which is gonna be uh, difficult to get, you know, electrons from the end of your cache into your processor very quickly. Um, you know, the speed of light is still a thing. We still have to obey it. Okay, um, so anyway, this is, not the, this is not the architecture that we're looking at. What we're looking at is computer architecture and in, ter in, in the context of computing, um, architecture, according to Merriam Webster, is the manner in which the components of a computer or computer system are organized and integrated. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. So a big part of this class is asking a question and then figuring out what is, an what is the answer to this question. 
you know, we want to be able to do X very fast. How do we actually do that? Um, so quickness is, is very, very much one of the, the priorities that we'll be looking at. Um, you know, nobody likes to be, to be waiting for too long to, for uh, things to happen on their computer. We want it to be snappy because we have zero attention span. Um, what about safely though? Maybe we, maybe we have some safety concerns as well. Um, definitely, sometimes we care about cheap. Uh, for example, if you have a bunch of cloud servers and you can maybe reduce the um, amount of work their CPUs are doing by 1% and you have a thousand CPUs and you know that, uh, on, that are on current consistently across many months, right? That can be a lot of power savings, which translates to um, money, right? Um, and yeah, cheap, efficient, these kind of go hand in hand. And there's a lot more things that we can discuss. So these, this is just one of the questions that we can ask. Um, another, another way of approaching computer architecture and thinking about other questions that we can ask is how do we provide usable abstractions to computer scientists and software engineers? I don't know about you guys, but I don't wanna program a web app in logic gates. Anybody want to do that? Okay, nobody, cool. That's what I thought. Yeah, so um, computer architecture is kind of sits in, in the gap between kind of, you know, your, your digital logic and like something along the lines of OS, right? Or programming languages. So we're filling in that gap. We're trying to get you from how do, how do we take these um, basically rocks that we've uh, pretend to know how to think and turn them into useful um, uh, machines that we as computer scientists or software engineers can actually use. Um, any other questions that you guys can think of that, that might, might be of interest to you? By the way, Zoom, if you, uh, I have you on my phone in my ear. So just pipe up, yell at me if you have, well, don't yell, but like say something if you have a question. Um, let me check the chat. You could ask what your hardware allows you to build in terms of architecture. Uh, yeah, what does our hardware allow us to build? Yeah, a lot of times we're gonna be running up against constraints like, I don't know, the fact that if you put things, you know, within a couple atoms of one another, interference may happen. Darn those quantum physicists. Yeah, we're gonna be, you know, a, a computer architects deal at scales where you know, quantum phenomena matter. Great one. Any others? Okay, yeah. Um, so, what another thing that we'll be looking at is kind of the fact that computing across um, mm, different applicate like different form factors is actually pretty the same. Now this is an iPhone. I guess it's their newest one. I don't know. I just I copied it from their website. You would think like, oh man, this is going to be like way different um, than say something like this, which is a Summit supercomputer, which is currently according to top500.org the fastest computer in the world, you think, yeah, these probably have nothing in common, but it's not actually the case. They're, they're many of the same fundamental components, but arranged in clearly different form factors. Um, and also, you know, um, uh, many different constraints, right? You know, you don't, 
if you had the power draw of this guy here in your iPhone, there'd be like zero battery life. Um, speaking of iPhones. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, these are just some of the things that we'll be discussing. Um, so why is any of this important? Why is this important to you is probably going to be a software engineer. Maybe you're going into computer science. Maybe you're going to be a software, uh, a computer architect. In which case, well, it's pretty self-evident that this course is useful. Um, so why is it important, like just in general, for the world? There's a few things. Um, if we don't have computer architecture, we don't have computers. And if we don't have computers, well, you know, I, I don't know what people are doing, right? They're, you're probably getting a CS degree because you've realized that everyone needs to compute something sometime, right? Um, and it's it really is everywhere. I, I think it's going to be even more like we're going to as IoT comes comes into its own um, and it becomes less of a meme and more of a real thing. You know, we're going to have computers literally everywhere. And if we don't have the architecture to back it up, we're going to be in big trouble. So there's this quote from Alfred North Whitehead. It says, civilization advances by extending the number of important operations we can perform without thinking about them. Right? We don't have to think about, oh, crap, where am I going to get food tonight? I'm just going to go buy Arby's or something on the way home, right? Um, and they, at Arby's, don't have to worry about, oh, crap, where are we going to get this meat from? It just shows up packaged, you know? Um, we have a lot of abstractions that we've developed over the years, computers being one of the, the biggest in the, in the recent history, that allow us to just not think about most things. I don't have to think, for example, about how I'm going to get from my house to, or my apartment to here, right? I just hop in a car and assume that the combustion engine is going to work. Um, so yeah, th this, is, this is very true in computer architecture as well. Um, you know, if you, if we were all 50 years older, we would be programming in Fortran and C or something like that. And, you know, we'd be having to worry about, well, shoot, where I'm, you know, maybe we were even programming in assembly, God forbid. And we have to worry about where we put things and which registers and everything like that. Very tedious. Um, now, I couldn't write something in assembly, definitely not x86 assembly, to save my life. So what um, uh, does computer architecture have? Why is it important for you? Um, so if you're a computer scientist or a software engineer or aspiring to be, be so, um, or even if you're just a sophisticated user, right? Understanding how your computer works is essential. Um, it helps you diagnose issues. You know, um, one of the major things at my job that we have to deal with is just the scale that we operate at. And so, you know, a lot of times we have to know a little bit about how memory works because it matters. Oh crap! Um, how how reliable it is, right? So. Another thing is we're going to be focusing a lot on the processor and the, the things surrounding it, right? This is kind of the core of computer architecture. And obviously, I think it's pretty clear that without processors, no computing happens. So it's probably important to, you know, study, study how those work. Um, and also another advantage for, this is especially true for Computer science, uh, computer scientists and software engineers, we care a lot about performance, right? And if we don't have a, a decent grasp on some of the fundamental architectural um, problems that could cause various performance degradation, we're going to have a hard time. So being able to be like, hmm, maybe it's this thing from computer architecture. Maybe it's 
Uh, maybe we're seeing a slowdown because of this thing over here um, uh, is extremely valuable. Um, all right. Any any questions before we move on? Okay, so I mentioned a couple slides ago that the architecture of most machines that you'll ever deal with are pretty much the same. You know, there, there's a lot of similarities at least. So here, let me let me zoom in. Here we have a high-end server. So you can kind of see, see this is a this is this would be on a, a rack in a data center. So this is an ultrabook from many, many years ago. Um, much different form factor. Here's mobile. We'll talk about these diagrams in just a minute. Um, also from many, many years ago. Again, I haven't updated the slides that much. Um, yeah. There's there's different parts in all of these, um, or sorry, different scale. We have the same parts. You know, we're still going to have to have a processor and memory, and we have different constraints, many different constraints. Right? We don't have to worry about, for example, sound here. The noise in a data center is like, like it's not like loud, but it's it's not quiet either. Um, so, but on your ultrabook. You know, I have I have this because it's fanless. Um, and yeah, you definitely don't want your a fan in your iPhone. Okay, so let's just zoom into these um, pictures a little bit a little bit more. So in the middle here, we have CPU sockets. This is where you put your CPU. If you've built a computer before, well, it's that except for four times um, because you know it's a server. Now, one of the important things in any CPU is, uh, uh, or any motherboard, is to have memory close to your CPU. Because if it's like far away, then it's gonna like actually, it does take time for electricity to move from you know your memory banks into your socket. So as you can see, we have memory pretty close to the CPU socket. Um, and then we have some um, PCIe slots. These are IO, you know, this would be where you put your graphics card, network interfaces, stuff like that. Um, let's see. I think these are probably SATA. That's where your 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 disks would be coming in. Okay, so let's look at kind of a a, a di much different form factor. This is a MacBook Air. It's a single chip. Um, we have the CPU. Um, we have uh, the the memory, which I um, is basically just on the like back side uh, effectively. Um, so same same things that we saw over there. Um, a bunch of different, you know, I/O things. You know, there's a Wi-Fi chip. There's all sorts of stuff in here. And then we have a slot for an SSD because, well, we still need a hard drive or something that emulates a hard drive. Here's an iPhone from a long time ago. Um, but as you can see, we still have a CPU, but in this case, we've kind of combined it with the RAM because there's not enough space and it doesn't, it's, uh, it's pretty efficient anyway. Um, the SIM card is going to be important because, you know, we want to be able to call people. I don't know. Does anybody call anybody anymore? Uh, and then other peripherals, Bluetooth, whatever. And then we have our flash memory as well. So. As you can see, a lot of the same components, but um, you probably aren't going to have four CPU sockets on your iPhone anytime soon. I definitely don't want that. So, um, all right. 
processors are everywhere too, right? Like this is a long time ago, but you know, you can see kind of some things here. Smart toilets, because you know that's a great idea. Um, we have you know some data centers, you know, your cars are full of them. Um, at this point, you should, if you want to, I feel like if you want to get into the car industry, you should go into CS. Um, you know, uh, gaming consoles, phones, everywhere have computers. This is a GPU from a long time ago as well, which you can tell because there's only one HDMI port. Um, so yeah, processors are everywhere. We're going to be diving in and uh, looking at um, how they work and why, uh, how we can make them faster and what has been done in the past to, to, do, uh, to get the performance gains that we have. Okay, so silicon is basically sand, right? So something happens between, you know, silicon and this dude here sitting like I sit at work, confused about what's going on and also having amazing posture, just like me. If you can't tell on Zoom, basically everything I say is sarcastic. Um, also in person, I've realized that masks kind of hide that. So, all right. So the cool things that happen are partially this class, it's partially not this class. We'll, we'll look at them over the next couple of slides. So uh, what is in this class? Um, well, we aren't gonna deal with, you know, physics and materials. That's what our physics and MME departments are for. They can deal with all the, all the stuff to actually, you know, figure out the properties of different materials so that we can use them in our computers. We don't care about that. Um, the EE department figures out all the AND and OR gates and everything, and we just tell them what we want and hope they can make it. Um, but where we come in is kind of right above that at microarchitecture. So we'll be looking at, um, you know, kind of your, your processor design, um, very, you know, maybe some flashbacks to 341. Um, we'll be then also spending a lot of time talking about processors because that's, you know, the core of everything that we, we care about in, in, uh, in computing. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about all the adjacent things to just the processor, right? We, there's more, um, more stuff on uh, tangential. Then we'll talk about architecture. So in this case, I, uh, instruction set architecture. Um, and then that's about as high as we're gonna go. We're gonna stop there because, you know, this processor abstraction stuff, that's for PL, which by the way, welcome back if you had me for PL in the past. Um, I know a few of you have. Um, welcome back if you had algorithms with me a couple of years ago as well. I, I doubt there's anybody who, is, who took that class with me. Um, so yeah, we'll leave this to all of the, you know, OS people and the PL people. And then we'll talk about, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll also leave, you know, compilers to, to them as well. Um, and, you know, eventually you get to me sitting at my desk writing Node.js all day and uh, you have the complete stack. I'm kidding, I, I'm, I, I haven't been writing as much Node lately and I'm really happy. Okay, so that's where this class sits. Um, you might know a lot about compilers or programming languages from previous classes. And you might, you know, if you're an EE or getting an E minor or whatever, um, or the computer engineering focus, right? You might've taken classes that cover this, but how do you get between the two? That's what this class is going to talk about.
questions? All right. Let's take a little bit of a um, look through the current state of computer architecture. Okay, so these are some basically the, the current trends. So first of all, Moore's law. Moore's law states that the number of transistors that we can build into a fixed area of silicon doubles every two years. Some say 18 months, who cares? It's, it's a very short amount of time, all things considered. Um, considering, you know, two years ago, nobody knew what a mask was. So um, this has been true for, for many, many years. Um, and it still is true. We're still, we're, we're still pretty much uh, able to to achieve this every couple of years. Um, and it is the single most important driver for historic, historic, keep that in mind, CPU performance gains. Um, and you can kind of see from this diagram, right, there's, there's lots, you can kind of see the, you know, the trend line, you know, you have your Pentium, some AMDs, PowerPC, i7s, you know, it, it's just getting, uh, and by the way, this is a log scale. So when you have a line on a log scale, it means that it's doubling. So that's good. Um, or that it's exponential, right? Um, and you can see way down here, right? The, the number of transistors on the four, uh, um, uh, 4004, I don't know what it's actually supposed to be called. Um, is much smaller, you know, 2,300 versus a lot. Okay, so here's here's that in a bit more, a bit larger. You know, it took 49 years for for us to go from uh, Intel 40 uh, 4,004 with 2,300 transistors to eight and a half billion on your A13 chip, and they fit even more onto the newer one. So yeah, um, Moore's law is really good. It allows us to do a lot more with the same amount of space. Um, and it's also allowed us to scale performance for, for a long time. Um, we're able to, if we can, you know, speed up things by 50,000 times, we're going to be able to do even more, um, uh, more things with our computers, right? If we can, if we can compute faster, theoretically, we can, we can perform more, uh, things, right? And um, there's been a lot of other things that have been that uh, this has allowed us to do. Because we have just more computing power, we're able to go from things like plug boards, right? If you ever seen like old computers from you know, the 40s, 50s, you got to go around and you know either if you're lucky, program them with punch cards, or if you're unlucky run around and change wires around. And now we, okay, let's change this to JavaScript, which is even worse than Java, as far as the like abstraction goes, you know, and people think that JavaScript is performant. Um, because it is, it's way more performant than, than this, you know, than the computers of, of the 50s, right? Um, We've gone from having to hand assemble everything, thank goodness, to having GCC and other compilers. Um, and we've gone from you know not having an operating system to having stuff like Windows 7, Windows 10, Linux, which is clearly the best. And, and the thing about it is, this is only possible because we have just, you know, we can kind of waste 
processor power now on stuff like Cortana. And nobody cares. Okay, so I think it's generally been a good trend as well, right? I, I'm glad that I don't have to um, hand assemble my programs. I'm glad that I don't have to um, run around without an operating system. Um, so, you know, so there's also been some bad things, you know, like social media, but whatever. Let's ignore that. So, um, th there's a bit of a problem, though. You might have noticed that since, you know, 2000s ish, um, clock speed hasn't increased alongside the uh, um, transistor count. So for the longest time, you know, we were pretty much able to get a, a clock speed increases just by packing in more transistors. Um, and you can you can see, you know, this is this is the kind of trend line of 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 um, um, uh, the the transistors, and then this is clock speed. It's kind of flattened out. You know, if you were around in like 2000, you'd be like, man, by 2020, we'll have like 10 gigahertz processors. I don't have a 10 gigahertz processor. Nobody does. And the reason is um, power. So when we double the clock speed of a, of a processor, it's gonna increase power consumption, not by twice, it's not linear. It's going to increase it by four to eight times, depending on some different factors. That's not good because already, you know, we're having to very aggressively cool processors to get them to have any performance. Um, you know, if you were around in the 70s or whatever, you probably didn't really need a fan on your CPU. It, it would probably be okay. Now, if you don't have a fan, it will just like explode in like two seconds. It's a little bit of hyperbole, but it's pretty darn close. Um, obviously, we have mobile processors, which have different constraints and everything, um, much low, lower power, um, but at the cost of performance. And so, yeah, we aren't really going to see too much clock speed scaling. You know, we've gotten up to like five and a half gigahertz, I think, more or less, um, which is definitely better than it was a couple of years, uh, even a few years ago. But it's very, very difficult to continue that trend um, without running into these power issues. So where do most of the future improvements come from? It comes from two places. It comes first from architectural improvements, which is what this class cares about. Um, and it also comes from process technology improvements. Um, which is not as much the focus of this class, but we'll, we'll talk about it as well a bit. And process technology by this, like, you know, actually the process of, of manufacturing the various components. Um, so yeah, it's very important that we research this stuff or else we can say goodbye to performance gains. And let me tell you, nobody's gonna, Nobody will pay you to say we cannot improve the performance of this. So here's a diagram of some different levels of, 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 of power density. Um, you can kind of see that, um, you know, we don't, we, we definitely, if we, if our trend line continues, this is basically a trend line more or less rough of power consumption of various processors over the years. If it continues, well, this is gonna be a problem. This is maybe a bit of hyperbole, but it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty darn, darn, uh, um, uh, darn hot. 
especially when you just consider the, the, the density, right? You know, obviously a rocket nozzle is much hot, hotter in the sense that there's just a ton of it. But your processor, I don't know about you guys, my phone sometimes, holy crap. I'd have to hold it up against the fit uh, near the fan in my car so it doesn't like explode like a Samsung. Um, so yeah, heat is becoming unmanageable. Um, uh, and that's why uh, this is one of the major factors for why we can't scale uh, our frequency. So what do you do? We're able to add more transistors, but we can't just like increase the frequency enough. So let's just make more processors. And this is where the rise of multiprocessors has come along. Um, if one CPU is very fast, why not make two? So you have two fast CPUs. Um, in theory, they allow you to double the amount of stuff that you can do in the same amount of time without having to change the clock speed. This is great, except for the fact um, that it's hard. Um, why is this becoming important though? The reason is so like, you know, go back to the eighties or whatever. And you have this application. It takes two times as long as you want to run. What do you do? You go and do something else for a couple of years and come back and it'll be fast enough. Um, with no effort. Problem is you can't do that anymore. You actually have to do some work to exploit parallelism. Um, you know, getting performance out of these multiprocessor systems requires you to like use something like, uh, you know, basically it requires you to take parallel programming from Dr. Wu when he comes back from sabbatical or just looking it up. Um, and it's it's hard. It takes a lot of work. Um, this is, by the way, is like if you ever. Um, uh, this is also the core of like GPUs as well, um, because pixel mashing is pretty processor intensive. Um, so let's just make a bunch of processors and put it on a different card and call it a day. So we've seen this even just in the past few decades um, uh, where cards are getting more and more cores, right? In 2000, you can just, there aren't many dual, dual core machines that exist, but you know, as, as this clock seed scaling has stopped, they've started at uh, just reallocating the additional transistors to more processors, processor cores, two, four, 10, um, you know, 16, um, uh, you know, this one has five, but, you know, um, 16 over here. And, you know, the new Ryzen lines, you can get like 64. Um, I think it's 32 physical cores with a hyperthreading, but, you know, this is consumer grade stuff, right? Like if you went to somebody, you know, back a couple decades ago, get decades ago, and it was like, yeah, so we have 64 cores, and you're going to be able to use all of them. They've been like, mm, pretty confused. Okay. Um, so let's look at one of these um, cards for a few more things that have happened over the past, um, you know, 50 years or so. This is the this is basically the diagram of of the of the chip, um, and you can see we have four cores: core zero, one, two, and three. And inside of the cores, a lot of it's allocated to cache. Uh, we'll talk extensively about cache because it's kind of one of the most important things in computer architecture. And you'll notice that there's a bunch of other stuff here like L1, L2 cache um, 
and then a massive L3 cache as well. We'll talk about all of this. If this is like, I have no idea what's going on, don't worry, we'll get to it. Uh, and then we have a memory controller, DRAM interface, and then way over on our DRAM slots, you know, we have our DRAM bank. Um, and so this hierarchy of memory, right? Um, if you, I think that Comporg is a prereq, so you've at least seen something about the, the memory hierarchy. This has become absolutely critical to computer architecture, or in the, you know, uh, most of the developments come in in the, these these areas, improving cache locality, improving uh, performance along those lines. Um, so let's go back to let's talk a little bit more about power. Um, so power is going to be proportional to to this this thing. So we have basically the amount of computing that we're doing, um, uh, uh, capacitance, voltage, and frequency. We don't really care about most of this stuff except for voltage and frequency, because frequency is also kind of proportional to voltage. Um, so when we look at this, we kind of realize that it's, it's somewhat, it, that our power is, is proportional to voltage cubed, frequency cubed. So this is where this, this four to eight times performance or our heat increase comes in. Um, so we have some capacitance per transistor. Um, uh, is decreasing. Um, leakage power is on the rise, though, because it just takes a lot of uh, there. And this is basically just the the amount of power that is required when the CPU is doing nothing to just stay on. Um, and so when when we look at the energy equation, where we have power and also time. Um, uh, we, we can see that, well, if we, if we reduce, if we reduce, um, if we increase power too much, then that's obviously going to increase the energy cost. So a question. Seems like this is not good. We don't, we want to use less energy. Do we always want to go with a low power design? No. Yeah, probably not. Sometimes we don't care. You know, if we're curing cancer, we probably don't care that it's low power or that it's like using up a ton of energy. If we're playing Candy Crush, um, it's fine if it kind of stalls for a second. So yeah, these sorts of questions are kind of not, we aren't going to ask too many of these just binary yes, this is good, this is bad, because there's it's tr all trade offs. You know, this, um, you know, with more, more power and energy, we're going to have to deal with heat, um, but maybe it's worth it if we can put in a, you know, really nice. Uh, cooling system, for example. Okay, so what are some things that we can do on this power question? First of all, we can do some things to dynamically scale the, the voltage. So basically, it, this is the biggest, one of the biggest contributor to power. Um, the bad thing is if we if we kind of increase the the frequency effectively and voltage when when we need additional boost performance, well, it's going to hurt overall performance because it will lag just a little bit from what uh, the workload is. Um, but this is maybe good for, say, mobile where like most of the time you're in standby. And it doesn't matter if 
you scale down um, your, your, free, your, your voltage in those cases and kind of shut down some, some or you know, just make everything at a, at a slower pace. Another option though, is we can just, just like shut down the entire power supply. Um, and this is commonly used in, in your mobile devices. Like it'll just shut down cores, not even put them into like low power state where they're still on. Just like, eh, you don't need to be on, um, which is probably, well, my, my phone is running Zoom right now. So it's probably not in that state. It's probably like going at full, full, full force. Um, the good is pretty obvious, right? If you have less things running, you're gonna use less power, less energy. Obviously the bad is you're gonna hurt performance pretty badly. Okay, so this is just one example of, of kind of the trade-offs that we'll be looking at. And here's maybe a, an, a, a kind of sample research question to get you, get you thinking in these terms. So say that you have a server has 10 cores um, and every 0.1 seconds, you're gonna receive a request. And each of these requests can be serviced by one core in 0.1 seconds. Um, and the question is, we're trying to optimize for power using some of these techniques. What, what could we do to, to reduce power consumption? Yes. Turn off nine cores. Yeah, I think that would work, right? Because we can, we receive the request at every 0.1 seconds and by the time the next request comes in, it's done, right? Um, oh, this is, this is uh, one of the things that we can, can do. We could also scale down the, the frequency on these cores, but you know, why do that when you can just get rid of nine of them? Um, obviously this is a pretty, basic example of some of the some of the things that we'll talk about, but this is this is just getting your, your brains in the right mindset. Okay, before we move on to class logistics, are there any questions about what I've talked about? Could you repeat what you just said about um, in the previous slide? Yeah. Um, so, so for this, probably one of the better options best, uh, is to just shut down nine of the cores. So by the way, the question for, for those of you who are in class, question on Zoom, just re-explain re -explain this slide. Um, so effectively, we have, we have a, a frequency at which we're receiving requests. It's one every tenth of a second. And it also says that we can service a request in a tenth of a second, which means that by the time we finish servicing the first request, you know, the second request will have just arrived. Um, so if you, for example, just shut down nine of these cores, since this is, this is talking about a single core, it can be serviced by one core in 0.1 seconds. You can, you can just turn off nine of them and call it a day. Yes. So could you reduce the frequency by half and then have like two cores running? That's a great, yeah, this is exactly the, the kind of thinking that we, we need to have in this class. So what would be, um, and a disadvantage of that for our users. Any, any ideas? Would there be any disadvantages? Slower turnaround. Slower turnaround time, right? They'd have to wait two tenths of a second. Now they probably don't care, right? But they might, it really depends on the application. So yeah, th this, is, uh, this is a great example of, of, of one thing that you could do. Um, did that explain on Zoom as well? I'm gonna assume I'm gonna assume that is a yes. Okay, so let's talk about 
class logistics. Um, and then we can we can come back to any questions uh, if we have time at the end. So here are some of the learning objectives for this class. After you've taken this class, you're going to understand all of the major trends that are shaping computer architecture currently and probably into the future. Um, so some of the things that we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about performance. We're going to spend pretty much all of the next lecture um, talking about how we evaluate the performance of different computers and, and um, uh, compare them. We've already touched a little bit on power. We're going to discuss that. We're going to talk about ISAs. So these are instruction set architectures. We're going to talk a lot about memory hierarchies. Um, we're going to talk about multiprocessor architectures. We're going to talk about pipelines. We're going to talk about out of order execution, multi threading, storage systems. We'll see how much of these last three I'll get to, but we'll, we'll probably get to some of them at least. Um, so we're going to talk about all of these things. These are the, these are the major things that we care about um, in computer architecture today. Um, I'm Sumner. Uh, my email is here. You're here. So you obviously know when the lecture is. Um, the registrar doesn't know when the lecture is because they double booked the freaking room. Um, but that's fine. That's expected. Um, my office hours are going to be basically right after class um, on Mumble. I'll show you the website in just a minute with more information. Or by appointment. I want to emphasize or by appointment because, you know, this may not work for everyone. It's really th the reason I. I, I'm doing this is because I, you know, I have a day job. I can't really just like uh, in the middle of the day host two hours of office hours. Um, but if you have a, a question and you just want like half an hour or whatever, I can definitely fit that in somewhere um, throughout the day or in, in some evening. Um, Our TA is Adam. He, his email is here. He's going to have host office hours as well. I'll, 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 let, I'll show you when I open up this course website in just a second. Um, so here's the course website. Let me zoom in because you probably can't see that. Um, lecture, Zoom link. Um, the office hours page over here. By the way, if you took my PL class a couple years ago, this, this may look familiar. I'm sorry, it's back. Um, and Adam's office hours are listed here as well. You can find information about how to hop on Mumble right there. Um, we have a matrix chat and a Piazza. The matrix is, I don't have it open. It's a, it's a messaging app um, that is pretty nice to use. And I have it open. Oh, probably don't want to show that. <laughs> um, uh, I have, it, I have uh, the matrix chat open like pretty close to 24 seven. So that's probably the quickest way to get a hold of me if you have a, a quick question. If you want to ask about grades, not a good place to do it. Um, uh, Piazza is good for, well, I'm not sure. It'll depend on what Piazza does. If it continues screwing over users and making you have to pay or whatever, I don't know. I have no idea what they're going to do. Um, but we have one that you can, I think you should all be enrolled on, um, hopefully. So let me just show you. This is just, you know, it's Discord, but not a botnet, is how I describe, uh, describe uh, matrix. Okay, so that's that. Um, uh, let's go ahead. I'll, I'll just before before I show you more of the course website. Please don't cheat. I'm not afraid to prosecute plagiarism at all, but um, it sucks. 
for you and you know i'm going to have to take off time work effectively uh, to deal with it um, but i will deal with it very severely as much as the dean of students allows me to which can mean failing you out of the class um, so yeah just don't copy anybody's code don't copy solutions during the exam and you know don't just randomly copy things from the internet um, from you know papers or whatever so um, let me go go back to the website here and show you just a few things there's you know um, basically exactly what's in the same the slides we'll talk about the grading policy in just a moment um, and on the left there's a schedule it's not really you know i kind of stopped scheduling stuff after the beginning of february we'll, we'll this ever evolving thing is key it is ever evolving but i will like let you know in class when things are like available and remind you when they're due as well after the hours we already just discussed this page is where you'll find any of the homeworks I'll provide both a PDF and a LaTeX template um, for you. Projects you can find here. I'm going to provide starter code in C um, for the projects. Um, lectures here. Um, basically, the lecture slides are available as um, handout format. So just you know, if you want to follow along on these, that's totally fine. And starting next class, which is going to be a week from now, because Martin Luther King uh, Day, um, we're going to have a worksheet. So there's, I think, about 30 of you. I'll bring 30 copies, and I'll just put them over there when I come in. So you can pick them up, just pick one up uh, at the beginning of class. Um, participation grade. But it's just kind of to try and get some interaction. Um, you know, historically, Dr. Wu has done stuff on the a whiteboard, but that really doesn't work over Zoom. So we're going to do worksheets. Um, and grade scope, I, I think I'll hold off on talking about grade scope until it comes up, which will be, I guess, next week. So this is what you probably care most about is what do you have to do to get a good grade? I try and make everything easy and make the entire class worth a thousand points. And so if you get, you know, 9,300 points, you're guaranteed an A. Um, and all the points are equal across the board. So midterm is worth 10% or 100 points, final 20%. Homework, there's gonna be four assignments, each worth 50 points. So, you know, they're 5% of your grade, if, if that wasn't clear. So probably should do them, e each of them. Participation, um, this is gonna be, you know, worksheets, piazza, as well as just, you know, some fudge factor that I, I might apply depending on how, interact, how you are interacting with people in class. Um, but worksheets and piazza are gonna be the, the majority of this, this grade. Um, each worksheet's gonna be worth like a couple of points. And as I said, um, you'll turn them in for participation grade and uh, we'll give you feedback, but it'll just be feedback so that you can like know if you're on the right track. Um, and I'll provide the solution to the worksheets and everything so you can go and, and reference them as well. Um, the biggest chunk is the projects. There are three projects um worth 400 points total um they're all simulators because you know this is i think one of the better ways of you know you can't really you can't really see like oh my cash is working so good so well you know physically you kind of have to simulate it um and so that's what we're gonna we're gonna do for project one and project two. 
these are two, you know, the, the first one, you'll be simulating different replacement strategies, uh, replacement policies, and then the next one, uh, different prefetch uh, strategies. We'll talk about all of these as we get into the class. And then the last project is a branch prediction simulator well, where you'll basically simulate branch prediction and you'll have a chance for both the project two and three to kind of come up with your own strategies for, for these. Um, so I think that should be pretty, pretty good. Everything's individual um, and you know, part of your grade will depend on code quality. Um, so if it's totally unreadable, uh, then, um, you know, that's not going to get the full points. Um, it's highly recommended that you use Linux for all the projects in the course. If you're using something else, I'm not going to help you and the TA is not going to help you uh, with any platform specific issues. So use something that's not Linux at your own risk. I think that it would be totally fine if you like use a Mac probably because it's all just like GCC. If you can run a, with like the only dependency being like math.h. So you're probably fine, but I definitely don't guarantee it. Um, also, this is a grad level class. I don't wanna have to look at your code and debug it for you. So if you have questions about like con conceptual or like kind of higher level um, code structure or understanding the starter code, stuff like that, totally ask. But like, it's like, it's seg faulting on me. I'm, I'm like, okay. Um, uh, that's, that's going to be your, your responsibility to figure out. Okay, so um, any questions before before I let you go? Yes. Oh, yeah, so about the textbook. So I said, read the textbook with an asterisk. because I was, I was thinking to myself, I should mention that I didn't read the textbook and I did totally fine. I didn't tell you that though. The, the textbook is required in the same way that going the speed limit is required. Um, I think it's a it's a decent textbook, and if you really like, maybe I shouldn't say this, but like you know, Google is a thing, and you know you can you can, you can specify what file type you want to look for and PDFs are a thing. Just saying. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, it's on the it's on the course website somewhere. Um, it's it's this quantitative approach. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, normal plus minus grade scale. So like 93 and uh, for, for A and then on the like up to 97 for B, B plus or B and then the B, B plus cutoff. I, so as far as like my philosophy with like curves and everything, I don't curve. If I do curve, it's at the very end of the class on the entire grade. So don't expect curves on individual projects or exams or anything like that. Um, if the distribution is not what I want it to be at the end of the class, I'll apply a curve to the cumulative grade. And we aren't gonna do a 56% grade curve like you know, some other classes that I may or may not have taught that I was not in control of the grade scale. Okay, any other questions? Okay, you're dismissed. Um, if you have additional questions, um, 
I'll, I'll stick around for a minute. 